good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Welcome to the second day event using potato white relatives in rib breeding for new source of genetic variability. My name is Thiago Mendes, potato breeder at the International Potato Center based in Kenya. Today, we'll, we'll explore opportunities and challenges of the new hybrid breeding strategy on utilizing crop white relatives. Some housekeeping information, as you can see on the screen, so videos, microphones off for the participants, the session it's being recorded and use the chat to post comments and the Q&A button for questions during the presentations anytime. So today we'll have four speakers. I want to thank you at Rolik from HZPC, Professor Dave Dowds from Michigan State University, Paola Gallero from the Universidad de la Republica in Uruguay, and Edwin van der Horsen, Solinta Research R&D Director. For the open remarks, I would like to invite Meredith Bornabel that will also moderate with me the today's section. But I think Meredith is having some challenge with her connection. I think she's not there. So then I'm going to proceed with her notes uh, on her behalf. And here we go. Following yesterday cases is studies on the conservation and use of crop white relatives by the pre-breeding. Today's presentation we will focus on the status and potential of true hybrid potato development developed via inbreeding at the deployed level. Hybrid breeding has become a method of a choice to efficiently produce varieties with superior performance due to the express heterosis effect, uniformity fast rate combination, and as a form of intellectual property protection. Meredith, I see you just join us. Do you want to jump in and make it? You are mute. I'll just go on. True habit potato breeding is a superb example of the use of crop wide relatives. It enables breeders to overcome self comfortability of deployed potato. It promises to help shorten breeding cycles and streamline trade introgression relative to the breeding potato as a heterozygous that deployed crop. As a crop pollinated crop, potato is a natural hybrid that is heterozygous. And being clonal propagated, its heterosis, its heterosis is fixed after crossing. But until recently, the developing and crossing pure bread lines was not considered possible for potato. The term TPS or true potato seed originated in 70s to describe a potato crop grown for botanical seeds as opposed to vegetative seed tubers. TPS was researched, researched and promoted through 80s and 90s under the premise that production for botanical seed would reduce the cost of planting material, reduce storage loss and disease load, enable more flexible planting times and avoid the use of value, valuable food as a seed. Universities in US and Europe and SIP in Peru explore a range of crosses between tetraploid, diploid, diploid and diploid and tetraploid by tetraploid breeding it schemes to develop heterogeneous tetraploid TPS variety. Much of SIP work research involve production, dormancy, storage and agronomy in efforts to obtain high uniform establishment of potato crops from botanical seed. Breeding include, included population improvement for TPS traits like flower intensity, uh, pollen production, berry set, and as well a white cross to introduce as well a wild cross to introduce cytoplasmatic male sterility. Progene were selected for uniformity of tuber appearance, maturity, cooking time, as well yield and late light resistance. Despite promise in several developing countries, the uptake of TPS was constrained by its long growing period, insufficient uniformity, and the lack of engagement of the private sector to fill out the value chain. Hybrid two potato seed will be uniform, care numerous stock resistant traits from crop wide relatives and beyond breeding, finding the best planting methods 
transferring the technology to farmers and establish a new multi-sector value chain will help enable high hybrid through potato seed as a new type of potato crop. With, uh, break, with that background, let's proceed to the first of today's sessions, first today's speakers. So I would like to, to introduce you to Ed Ronlink, hope I'm pronouncing your name well, uh, potato leader, hybrid program, leader hybrid potato at 8ZPC. The floor is yours, Ed. So thank you, Tiago, for the introduction. Um, and of course, uh, thank you also for the invitation for uh, industry companies' uh, participation to this, uh, uh, to this workshop uh, on the use of profiles relative use in uh, potato breeding and then related to hybrid potato breeding. So uh, the takeaway I, I took from the presentations yesterday was that, it, that it's still um, extremely promising uh, what's, what's coming out of, of pre-breeding research. And it's, uh, I could here and there also feel the, the frustration that so far so little has been done with the introduced uh, hybrids from such efforts. Oh, sorry, what did I, I should have started at the beginning. Going back to the beginning, sorry, with my first slide. Um, <clears throat> um, so since 2011, I uh, am a plant breeder in uh, HLPC, a uh, research station based at the, the, in the north of the Netherlands, um, where we are uh, producing traditionally tetraploid varieties for more than 50 years. Um, the reason why we are so close to the North Sea, as you can see on the, in the red arrow, is that traditionally um, we find very little aphid pressure in the North, which makes the traditional development of varieties fairly easy in this region. And by doing so, we uh, don't lose much material while uh, building up uh, populations. Uh, uh, propagating our selections and developing new varieties. Our core activity is the development of new varieties that meet the wishes and demands of our customers through sales companies, HFPC and STET. And although maybe you, are, you have heard of HFPC before, uh, STET is a different um, uh, sales company that represents a lot of the germplasm, which was formerly owned by Van Rijn. Um, so, but breeding of both for both uh, product profiles is done at the same research locations in in, uh, in Metzleria. Um, so, in the years we developed our cell, our specialism in the domains of plant biology, plant diseases, uh, quality, molecular biology, and already for more than a decade we have invested a lot in exploration of genetics. Um, of the potato. And we have an intense collaboration with a group of affiliated breeders to be able to handle the vast amount of clones that we have to select. In total, we have 103 people employed. Uh, that doesn't include the affiliated breeders, uh, where we breed for sectors, traditional retail fresh and processing. So traditional is what's usually referred to as export markets. Retail, retail fresh is supermarket and processing is uh, French fries and crisps. Um, so absolutely no other processing traits such as starch or starch flakes. And uh, so, as I said, TPS hybrid breeding uh, was under investigation for many years, but not picked up until 2011. Then a short view on where we export our, our tubers to uh, more than 90 uh, countries. Uh, in many countries, it's just an, uh, a single agent with a telephone, but in, all, in, in big markets, there's also a, a sales office. Um, and you can indicate from this such a map, such as this one, that it's uh, especially, especially important to be able to be close to an ocean harbor, to be able to, to export this many potatoes. So it's roughly 900,000 tons per year, and that's only HZPC. Producing areas of the, uh, all this um, 
CTUBERS is the European Union, although UK is uh, not, no longer Europe, it's still considered to be a product, production area for HFPC Holland, um, and an additional production is taking place in Russia. Uh, and that's just seed multiplicated uh, seed tubers. Uh, in the case of China and India, we produce mini tubers from vitro stock. That goes through different channels, but all to be able to produce healthy and, and sell, sell healthy seed tubers from our varieties. Then, of course, the, for such a big production and sales company, it might seem strange to step into hybrid breeding because until now, we are the, the only one who is uh, openly uh, known for working on diploid hybrid potato. So why, why would we at all? So being a seed potato producer and exporter, we also wish to play a leading part in variety development. Uh, but many markets are out of our reach uh, due to perishable products, but also because local production efforts uh, often strand because of very high disease pressure locally. So those are very difficult to overcome problems. Um, our current variety development runs as fast as possible, but still the refreshment of the portfolio is very slow. Um, and actually, actually, most potato breeders follow the same scheme and most potato breeders introduce at least three varieties each year. And that's something that's actually uh, astonishing really in the world of, uh, of plant breeding and marketing, because this actually this year, 2021 resulted in a list of 513 registered varieties in 2021. That's the Netherlands alone. And of these 513, only five reach 500 hectares multiplication only six reach a thousand hectares, so 2,500 acres. And actually of those six, two no longer have PBR. So they are too old um, to, to, for a company to make any money off. Uh, so, and of course we still have the Russet Burbank uh, and other, and Bintje, not to forget. So varieties with expired PBR take 20% of the multiplication. And so, this high number of varieties and the dominance of very old varieties indicate that potato development doesn't move fast enough, simply said. So even with new breeding techniques and methods, we can solve some issues, but not the issue of having limited, of, of having control over the tetrapod genetics. And hybrid TPS has the potential to solve those issues and this is the main reason why HFC stepped into this, um, into this breeding type. I must say, after all this, um, HFC still goes after the hybrid potato to be sold as seed tubers. So that, and, and that of course is quite different between breeding companies and institutes. Some say, um, some, some, aim for a hybrid potato that will eventually grow from the seed up to a uh, ware crop, where we see that as really far distant in the future. And our first focus is a hybrid variety where the customer, so the farmer growing ware potatoes to sell, does not see the difference between a hybrid, uh, a hybrid crop or the traditional tetrapod crop. Then moving on to the historic crop wild relative use in potato breeding. So far, the focus has been on late blight, potato virus Y, and um, cyst nematodes. Of course, uh, it, it's, been, it's been broader than that, but the main focus was on this. These three are very important for both growers and seed tuber producers, and they are often um, not mentioned when you go to big uh, conferences or seminars, but of course, the seed producer also has quite a lot of power on what breeding companies breed for. Other areas of focus, of course, uh, bacterial wild wart disease, etc. cetera, Erbinia, not a very important one, difficult to tackle, root knot nematodes, uh, concerning insects, Colorado beetles, wireworms, viruses like uh, uh, leaf roll virus. Um, there, I put mistakenly TVY again, but uh, let's not forget uh, mot potato motto virus, motto virus coming with powdery scab. So, and the genetic complexity 
capacity of the 4 X potato in combination with multi allelic control of those resistances and traits makes progress extremely slow. And there is, it, it is very difficult to, to, uh, to, to tackle that. And by now, of course, many more than 50 potential markers are known for trait selection, but the most implemented are a handful of dominant R genes and QTLs, some QTLs for quality traits. And thinking back on uh, a presentation yesterday on, on uh, Rastonia resistant, um, that would be ideal for growers in specific markets to be able to grow a healthy wear crop. But that would be something extremely difficult to implement in a potato growing area like the Netherlands. So if that, because if this would mean that Rostonia can move with seed tubers undetected, many customers will ban Dutch potatoes seed altogether. So you have to be very careful with what, what you wish for. So in case of Rostonia resistance, if we would ever be able to build a hybrid variety that has a Rostonia resistance, there would be no way we could produce seed tubers of such a variety in the EU. But that would no, that's, no, that's no big problem. We can grow it closer to our target market. So going to the present situation where low hanging fruit has been picked. So the dominant ones we tackle. So now what? Well, of course, the, rec the recessive trades have received very little attention. So resistance and resistance stacking um, while maintaining strong selection on product profiles, it, it, it's very difficult because that leads to a re repetitive compromise between resistance, yield, and quality. Of course, we wish to retain all resistances used in a specific cross, but then if yield and quality prevails in certain genotypes that only have part of the resistance, those things keep on going to the market because it's usually a commercial enterprise. And that, that, that's still something that's in the way of fast progress. And at the same time, we've moved in three decades from simple genetic maps, RFLPs, AFLPs, to more and more SNP arrays, first 8,000, 20,000, to sequencing, GWAS, genomic prediction. So in all types and all stages of plant breeding, we can do so much more, but still, uh, we are talking about quite a complex genome. And um, something that I hear a lot, uh, so, and also uh, a statement that I used to make in terms of uh, um, getting a certain job done in plant breeding is claiming that marker assisted selection um, reduces time and resources spent. But actually that is nowhere near true because your cycle from cross to Variety stays the same in tetraploids. You can shave off half a year if, if you really uh, put a lot of effort in that. But the only thing that it does is um, enhance your chance of finding the combination that you're after. But on all other cases, it just adds a lot to your budget. So in, in hybrid breeding opportunities to really make the next step, is, is uh, finally we are able to create elite inbred lines containing many dominant resistances because they are there for the taking and we're in the same crop. So that's relatively easy. Um, also in the last years, uh, we realized that there's actually quite a lot of self-compatibility genes floating around in many different wild relatives. And actually the SLI gene proves to be the most successful one. So it was important that we get this one and select it against the other ones. Otherwise, you have no clue what you're working with. So that was also one, uh, one opportunity that we took straight away. Um, then, of course, um, being located inside a breeding company also means that you can use all the in-house knowledge on phenotyping, yield trials, plant pathology, molecular biology, biometrics, bioinformatics. And as you can see on the, on the pictures here, these are actually the current hybrid trials growing from seed tubers fitted in a big field of the traditional program. So, and on the top, that's Central Africa 
and the south is close to here in the in the Netherlands. So actually, um, where the complexity in reading is increasing, and we still and we are trying to teach people in the company really how to implement hybrid breeding, the practical side, so the actual phenotyping, that becomes, that's relatively easy. Then, of course, uh, starting in 2011, the deployed material I had to work with was still uh, a lot of hybrids directly between tuberosum and wild types. So a lot of the quality was missing. So we either had the choice to go for uh, going for the resistance genes and stack them, or move to a more broadly developed uh, base with a lot more quality. We took that route. Of course, it, it, it meant that we had to invest a lot in bringing all tetrapoid clones to the diploid level. Um, of, of course, you see hundreds of them come by every year. So that makes it relatively easy also to tap into the big amount of tetrapoids that we, that we produce anyway. Uh, actually, it's one of the least successful uh, parts of, of a hybrid breeding program because bringing tetraploids to diploids is an extremely frustrating en enterprise, as I think many of you know, uh, because we still use the, the old-fashioned uh, Freja crossing way of doing it. Then, going to um, the, the, the topic, why we really need to work with crop wild relatives further is really to first of all focus on this recessive traits um, secondly the quantitative traits like the, the so-called difficult traits like the abiotic stresses uh, where phenotyping is never ideal but also in in, um, in terms of uh, specific um, no, let's skip that. If, if I would like to uh, adapt a local uh, uh, a hybrid to a local circumstance, then it formally it would be the case that I would imp try to import such a genotype, use it in recombinant selection, and then eventually after 10 to 15 years, send the, the selected genotypes back to this location. And if that would be like a country like Egypt, um, it's actually quite far off. While if you're, if you're really using crop wild relatives and um, grow inbred lines out of them, multiple, you can create a lot of hybrids and test them locally, directly, without this very long development stage in the European Union, where they do not belong. Uh, last point, the development of mass for negative traits. That's something that actually comes into play now that, that mass becomes more, becomes cheaper. Actually, development of markers running of markers becomes cheaper. So uh, besides the positive uh, markers that we use for, for existing, uh, like, um, like tuber shape, there's always a lot of other traits in, uh, regarding tuber shape that you do not wish, such as banana-shaped flat tubers, uh, pear-shaped, etc. And if you produce it, and they're very easy to identify in diploids. So if you manage to make high, uh, markers for those traits, you can get actually get rid of them and remove them completely from your germplasm. And then in a later stage, when you find a new crop wild relative that you want that you wish to use, you can use these markers to get rid of those specific traits and use more of the genetics of the wild type. So you stop using it just for a single trait. But of course, also the previously used uh, wild relatives like Stoloniferum, Hygiena, Bertolti, Bilbo they need to be evaluated again. It took researchers decades to develop them on a, on a diploid or tetraploid level. They were used in our breeding program once or twice. And then as they were present in tetraploids, the, the original clone was not used anymore. And therefore it says, huh, you know the saying, you don't know what you got till it's gone, and that's exactly what's happened in many cases, especially when we were faced with PSTPD, which meant that we had to get rid of a lot of old stocked uh, TPS. Of course, I would like to point out also some uh, issues that we that you always have to keep in mind when moving to diploid hybrids. Um, 
there are a lot of difficulties coming up when you bring the tetraploids, the diploids also when they have been used previously to incorporate wild type alleles. So when, uh, for instance, uh, an unreduced gamete cross or uh, a wild type was doubled to make the cross with a, a tetraploid uh, clone, usually the linkage track is not visible in the background, but as soon as you make the induction, you get everything back. So the unwanted wild type is then on top of inbreeding depression. So um, the, the success of making inductions on tetraploids, which have uh, like the last couple of years been used to integrate resistances, are the most difficult to make diploids out of. Then one point is if you're focusing on combining a lot of resistances in one clone and you rely on markers. One minute. Yes, okay. Then you lose, a, you, have, you run the risk of, uh, of losing a specific resistance because you're just focusing on markers. Because as for instance, if you combine many markers, uh, many resistances together, it's very difficult to validate them. And that is something that I would like to also you to think about. And then of course, it's always said, it's really easy to produce hybrids because this is much cheaper than tetraploids, but keep in mind that you have to make hundreds and hundreds and even uh, uh, creating inbred lines with just a few resistances is quite an expensive enterprise. And of course, uh, what we, that, that's a problem specific for us. Um, uh, protoplast fusions and other type of techniques to overcome crossing barriers are uh, considered to be GM in the UA, in the, in the EU, <laughs> unless the result could also be obtained by natural crossing. So this eliminates many of the exotic solanum types for us. So nevertheless, if, you know, I always say, if, this, if these are the only points of attention, then still this is a fantastic innovation to, uh, to work in. And I would like to show you this last picture where innovation is that's, and that's the corner where we are working in. It's not always liked, not even within a big company like uh, HFPC where we are quite addicted to, uh, to tubers. So uh, once again, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I will be happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a great presentation, great points of attention. So we have to think about hybrid. <laughs> we're gonna get the questions at the end of the session and we're gonna move on now with the presentation with uh, Professor Doubts. He will talk about crop wide relatives in deployed hybrid versus traditional potato breeding. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Doubts. All right, thank, thank you, Tiago. I was on mute there. And um, uh, okay, hold on. I'm, I'm good here. Or, and um, I'd like to reiterate that um, Ad's presentation just now, um, everything he says, I would echo that. Um, I think you'll see some overlap here. I think uh, the, his diploid breeding program is on the same page of, of ours in terms of uh, philosophy. And so what I'd like to do today is talk about our efforts in, in developing a diploid hybrid breeding program at, a, at Michigan State University and, and some of our experiences and, and how we're approaching it and how the crop wild relatives play into this whole process. And I, I will be highlighting work of a, a recently graduated student, Dr. Natalie Kaiser, my graduate, current graduate student, Will Bailing, and then also a former graduate student, <coughs> Dr. Maher Al Salani, who is uh, with Cavendish now as a potato breeder. But many others have uh, contributed to the uh, program. So, okay, I need to get my slides going here. Yeah. I thought I had, how do I change my slides? Okay. So um, we, uh, as uh, we all know that tetraploid breeding is a long and inefficient process. And I really don't need to go into that detail now because um, that, that's been discussed, but I'll just uh, make those points that with tetraploidy, we can't fix traits. And also every time we make a cross, all the traits segregate, so we're never fit. 
we're always selecting for an enormous amount of traits in each population that we're screening. And the tetraploids absorb undesirable alleles, as Ad was saying, from those crop wild relatives, and purging them at the tetraploid level is essentially impossible. Uh, so we really have in, uh, invested in that the idea of F1 hybrid diploid uh, potatoes and, and started from scratch about eight years ago. And we know the advantages. It's very similar. I, I liken it to maize breeding where we can maybe capture heterosis, have the seed propagation. Um, we can apply uh, breeding methods that, that elude tetraploid uh, breeding. And, um, and we, we can also use a lot of the modern, you know, methods and genomic resources that are much more um, adapted to diploid breeding than, than uh, tetraploid uh, breeding. Uh, what I see as a, a major obstacle to diploid breeding is self incompatibility because we really need to develop inbreds. And, uh, and so really, the, the bridge to that is, is SLI, and it's the, um, so uh, the work's been done back in the 90s, but uh, some great work in the Netherlands by um, uh, Corentin Klot at uh, Wagenhagen has, has been able to uh, link markers to SLI that is uh, giving us great insights into the germplasm that we're uh, working with. So um, I'll, I'll bring that uh, forward. Uh, uh, shortly, so this is kind of just an overview of where uh, where we are where we are. We've been using recurrent selection and and what I refer to as back cross breeding to introgress self compatibility and also do some R gene selection based upon markers. And then we've been attempting to uh, develop some inbreds through through selfing. Um, and also, just going to note that we also have been using gene editing to try to introduce uh, self-compatibility into the germplasm. And we've made some crosses with, with some of our um, material from different populations to really look at whether we have heterotic pools along the way, but that we're kind of jumping the gun on that, but um, I'll talk more about that uh, shortly. So our, our major effort a uh, number of years ago was was trying to integrate the self compatibility. And we started with a diploid population that was made up of uh, various uh, species Slanum chacoensis, Slanum fereja, uh, Slanum berthaltii, Microdonum. And then also um, part of that makeup was also some dihaploids of, of tuberosum. So um, we created this pool of, of took these uh, clones and we crossed them to what I called my self compatibility donors. Um, one of the uh, major self compatibility donors is M6 from Shelly Jansky's program, plus other clones. At that time, we had no understanding of the genetic makeup of self compatibility, so I was trying to have a a, a broad genetic base of self compatibility. Um, but what we've learned in the in the past uh, year or so is that with the, with the SLI that um, integrating self compatibility is really dominated by the um, the SLI locus, and that what we can see in our breeding program, if you look at this figure, is that the the SLI homozygotes were increasing through our cycles of recurrent selection, and as our self compatibility was going up, and as and our uh, SLI negatives and heterozygotes were, were going down uh, uh, through the cycles. And, and so when we went in and, and examined some of the uh, diploids that we uh, felt were contributing to self-compatibility in our breeding program, we could see that there was a, select, a collection of, of um, diploids that were SLI uh, positive, either in a homozygous or heterozygous condition for the diff various markers. And, uh, but there were also self-compatible clones that did not contain SLI. So, um, so I think SLI actually explains a majority of the self-compatibility, but not all the self-compatibility in our diploid uh, germplasm at this time. And so uh, we were using recurrent selection to try to 
integrate self compatibility, but we were, we were also trying to develop the germplasm from, from a breeding perspective. And so we were uh, tracking um, vine maturity, scab resistance, tuber appearance, tuber shape, tuber yield, tuber number, specific gravity. And so we were, um, and we were really making nice progress in this program of, um, of, re of recurrent selection. So we went from very small tubers in the first uh, cycle of the program to actually material that, that seems to have uh, pretty good uh, uh, size and appearance uh, through the cycles as, as we're moving as we're moving through. Uh, our breeding um, targets in, in Michigan is a lot for the round white chip market. So we were selecting a lot for round white tubers. And so uh, we have more clones uh, than this, but this was a, a, a picture that from um, Dr. Alassani's uh, uh, work just showing uh, what he was able to achieve. And as Odd was talking, he was uh, mentioning about uh, extracting uh, dihaploids from their elite germplasm. And that's been a major effort by us is to have a, a germplasm pool, you know, from our uh, good cultivars and advanced breeding, breeding lines. And uh, some of my technical staff, Kate Shaw and Chen Zhang, were um, instrumental in extracting dihaploids from uh, germplasm from our breeding program and other varieties um, that have been released. And this is just a short list of ones um, up to 2017 that we were extracting. And our targets were um, varieties that contain specific traits and also from a diversity um, point of view. So we, you can see that we were targeting uh, potato virus Y resistance, late blight resistance, scab resistance, chip quality, and uh, and also just having a diversity of, of germplasm. And, uh, and so to integrate self-compatibility into that material, we, we instituted a, what I call the back cross pr uh, program because um, it's not a typical back cross because we don't back cross to the same clone each time. We're back crossing to tuberosum dihaploids and um, trying to maintain the self-compatibility as we go through the F1, back cross one, two, and three in our germplasm. And while we were doing that, we were screening for those other agronomic traits as we did in the recurrent selection. And we feel we've have a, a lot of nice uh, germplasm um, in this uh, material. And um, we've been able to backtrack, you know, some of the uh, dihaploids and looking at the self-compatibility as we know that W4, which is a, a tuberosum dihaploid, was uh, SLI heter a heterozygote. And uh, so uh, there's an understanding that SLI is in our tuberosum gene pool. So we were screening some of our dihaploids for SLI. And you can see in here that some of the clones were SLI negative, some had a, um, a the SLI alleles, but nothing in a homozygous state. And then some of our dihaploids from others actually gave us some um, dihaploids that were homozygous for SLI, which as we know, we can't uh, detect directly because usually the dihaploids are, are male sterile or male infertile. So it's really after we cross them into our other germplasm that we can uncover that uh, self-compatibility. And, uh, and like our back cross our uh, recurrent selection material, we have some nice clones that are, that are coming through our back, back cross program. And, um, and so I, I'm not presenting any data, but last year we did run a field trial and at our research farm with some of our better clones and the, the yield potential on, on some of our clones was uh, comparable to uh, the Norlin variety that was our check in that, in that trial. So we, we think we're making progress. I think we need, we need to do more trials to, to, to um, get a better understanding. We have another trial um, set up this year to collect data this, this fall. And um, we use uh, the, the SNP array to characterize our germplasm. And, um, and so just here's just a, a, a small set of the material from um, 
our recurrent selection program, which, oops, sorry about that, that, um, so I think the, so the recurrent selection material is in, in magenta uh, and, and then our backcross material is in that green. And so when we look at it from either a, a, a tree, a tree or a principal component analysis, you can see that our, our recurrent selection, which is made up you know, of a combination of species is quite distinct from our backcross material, which is really, um, trying to backcross out the Chakawensi background of the M M6 self-compatibility uh, donor. And, um, and so in 2019, we put out a lot of transplants to try to look at the, you know, what, we, what we're seeing when we make different types of crosses. And you know, some of them are between S1s and uh, some S2s or even just non-inbred material. And uh, we were finding some uh, pretty impressive uh, uh, tubers in the fall from our uh, seedling transplants put out to the field. And so we're, we're feeling you know, positive about the, the ability to um, create uh, hybrids with good, uh, good tuber, tuber vigor and yield and, um, at, uh, when we get to that, that stage. Uh, well, I'm gonna switch now and jump over to um, my uh, former student, Dr. Natalie Kaiser. And uh, she um, was using Solanum chakawensi as a source of Colorado potato beetle resistance. Five and we minutes felt... left. Excuse me? No, sorry, five minutes left. Five minutes, Just thank to let you. you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so she was using the chakawensi, which has been around for decades. And so she's been able to, she generated an, an and F, some F1s between the self-compatible and, and, and our uh, uh, beetle resistant donor created an F1, made an F2 population and took it down to the F5s uh, to create inbreds for um, beetle resistance. And she conducted field trials at our research farm. And then she was able to map the uh, the uh, leptin synthesis and the beetle resistance to chromosome two uh, using this, this germplasm. And, um, and so now we're um, taking the, we've taken this material, crossed it to some of our uh, diploid uh, selections with self-compatibility, created F1 populations. And now we also have F2 populations that are in the field right now, waiting to be uh, uh, attacked by our Colorado potato beetles. And so we'll have more information uh, this year. And, um, and the third, uh, the third uh, student I wanna talk about is Will Bailing's work, where we've kind of taken on the challenge of, can we, can we integress the EBN1 species into our diploid breeding program? Because they contain so many important traits that, are, that, that we, we think would be valuable to diploid breeding. And I really feel that at the diploid level, we can make I think better progress because we um, uh, don't have the complexity of tetraploidy and the linkage drag that goes along with all that. So uh, we're using uh, various EBN1 species for late blight and beetle resistance. And so we're using Solanum varicosum as a bridge to try to access the EBN1 species and um, not going into real a lot of, a lot of details, but um, Sheldy Jansky at Wis University of Wisconsin and John Bamberg at the Gene Bank have created uh, some varicosum uh, hybrids between uh, the, uh, uh, some of the other EBM1 species. And Will has taken some of that germplasm and then crossed it to our um, good clones from our, dip our diploid breeding program. And so we're able to try to uh, access Bulbocastanum, Commersonii, Panatosectum, in, as well as um, you know, uh, using uh, James E.I. and Cardiophyllum as, as um, part of the, the bridging. And so here, here's just one slide showing that um, we got the varicosum by EBN1s um, and crossed with actually USW4 dihaploid. And we're getting, these are just greenhouse tubers but we're getting what we think are uh, potentially integrated um, uh, germplasm of these EBM1 species. 
And just to um, uh, uh, connect that, we've been using gene editing. My uh, former student, Dr. Felix and CISO and Swati Nada Kaduti have um, um, gene edited the uh, diploid germplasm for the sRNase locus and obtained self compatibility, which gives us some uh, alternate sources of self compatibility. And I have a, a student, Talani uh, Jayakoti, who has been um, doing some sequencing work so that we can have more genomic resources. So she's been uh, sequencing another uh, homo doubled monoploid DM1S1, which is out of Richard Bayou's program. And we have, um, and we're currently uh, moving towards sequencing varicosum and also uh, microdonum with the partnering with uh, Robin Buell in the plant biology the department. So to sum things up, you know, dip, we feel that diploid breeding is more efficient and effective. It can speed, um, speed up the, the breeding cycle compared to tetraploids. Um, it, it's more amenable to using crop wild relatives. And it also allows us to better study and exploit the traits you know, uh, as seen by the work of um, my student, uh, Natalie Kaiser, and it also to maybe access the tertiary gene pool of those EVN1s. And, um, and also the diploid just in general will let us access genomic tools and gene editing more effectively. So uh, thank you for your time and I'll be able to stay on for questions later. Thank you, Professor Dave. Excellent presentation. Yeah, so, we have a lot of things to do on, on hybrid potato. It's good to see that those work that we have done, amazing. We're gonna go for five minutes break and we'll be back. Uh, stay around, we'll be back in five minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> see you. Hello, welcome back. So we're now moving to the second session. Just a quick reminder about the, the Questions, you can post it anytime on the Q&A session. I mean, the, the icon you can see on the bottom there. Please do it. So I will introduce you to the next speaker uh, for the session about potato hybrid breeding techniques. And um, Paola Gallero from the Universidad de la Republica, Uruguay, to talk about the biological challenge to use crop white relatives in hybrid potato breeding. The floor is yours. Paola. Thank you, Tiago. So I, I was posed with this challenging task of, of telling you in under 20 minutes about the biological challenges that uh, we might face when using potato wild relatives in, in hybrid breeding. Um, uh, here is a, a short outline of, of the topics that I um, decided to focus on. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but um, I, I'll try to give you um, a bird's eye view of the topic. So we are going to talk about how diversity in, in crop wild relatives populations can be um, a problem uh, or a challenge, and also uh, about some difficulties in, in hybridization. And then I'm going to take you into the, the chromosome behavior in the hybrids. And we'll talk about something that has come up before, which is um, retention of wild traits and, and linkage drag. So to start with, um, one thing that we like about uh, crop wild relatives is that they are diverse. Um, but that means that only a few species have been actually explored for resistance traits. And uh, this, this was the picture in, in 2015. Uh, yesterday, Norma told us uh, a lot about um, all the accessions that they keep at SIPS Bank and uh, how they are um, characterizing them and screening them to make them more accessible. And, 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 and the, but the problem is that there are so many and that not all of them have been explored. Uh, moreover, um, not all accessions in one species carry the traits of interest. So we hear that um, Solanum commerzoni is um, resistant to bacterial wilt, but not all accessions are. Uh, so as you heard yesterday in, in Uruguay, we, we work um, a lot uh, with uh, 
these wild relatives looking for resistance to, to bacterial wilt. And as you can see here, um, some accessions are even more resistant than the, the resistant uh, controls, but some of them are more susceptible than the susceptible cultivars. So uh, that's another problem that, that needs attention. Um, and then um, it happens that in complex traits, accessions vary in behavior in different streams. So for example, in this um, uh, table, you can see how different uh, screenings for verticillium wilt uh, show different behavior for, for the same accessions, depending on how the, 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 the screen was performed. Uh, and uh, also uh, depending on, well, because of the complexity of these traits. And, and then that means that sometimes we can select an accession and make a lot of effort to, to introduce it in, in hybridization breeding. And that is maybe not the best candidate. Another challenge is that um, sometimes we can face difficulties in crossing crop wild relatives with cultivated potato. Here is an overview of um, all the um, different um, barriers to hybridization. And I will not uh, talk about all of them, but I will just focus on two of them. Um, um, pollen pistil uh, interactions that uh, impede the development of pollen tube in the style, and also about um, the endosperm balance number that um, makes um, embryo um, endosperm failure and then uh, it hampers the development of the embryo. Of course, the sterility of the hybrid is also a very important barrier and, um, and cytoplasmic male sterility is, is also a problem, uh, but um, I will not be talking about that because of time. Um, then we have the two main uh, barriers that I'm going to discuss are then pre-zygotic, so before the zygote is formed, is pollen pistil crossing compatibility. And post-zygotic uh, is the, the barrier of endosperm balance number. And uh, one advantage of uh, diploid hybrid breeding is that this should be a problem only for one EVN species and not for two EVN species as we were seeing earlier. Um, so these beautiful pictures are taken from the technical manual at SIP and then you can see that um, uh, there are different levels in which the pollen tube is uh, arrested from growth. Uh, here is um, the, when the pollen is not germinated, um, and it move, the pollen tube moves towards the first, third, second, third, and the last third of the stick, the style, and when it actually gets into the placenta. Um, so, um, apologies. Um, this could be a problem if the, the crop well relative that we're crossing with potato is not compatible, but we can overcome this problem uh, with mixtures of pollen or using mentor pollination. Another uh, barrier is the endosperm balance number barrier. As I was telling you, for two EBM species, that should not be a problem. We have uh, the, the double fertilization. So the, the, the zygote is formed, it's a diploid zygote and the endosperm is formed and it, it holds the, the right ratio between maternal and paternal factors. So that, that's not a problem. But what happens when the, the wild relative is a one EBM species, then, um, the, the zygote form, it's a, a sorry, it's a triploid, it's a diploid zygote, sorry, but the, the um, ratio between factors from maternal side and paternal side is not correct. And then the endosperm fails. And of course you can overcome this with embryo rescue. Um, but another uh, way to overcome this is the, advantage of some species producing unreduced gametes. For example, if 
uh, we have uh, one EBN relative that is um, uh, crossed with a, with a diploid potato and uh, the unreduced ovules are fertilized, then uh, those uh, are, have a good balance for the endosperm and then those are um, viable, but the problem is that the embryo that is developed there is a triploid, and that has a lot of uh, consequences in segregation and fertility. So we have two possible scenarios. One in which we cross um, the diploid potato to a diploid wild relative. And in that case, we have uh, in the hybrid two sets of uh, chromosomes, it's a diploid hybrid, and the pairing in the meiosis of this hybrid is regular and we have uh, fertility. But in the other scenario, when we cross with a one EVN relative, where if the crossing is uh, successful through unreduced gametes, then we will have two sets of chromosomes coming from this wild relative. And that will mean that we will have irregular chromosome pairing with uh, uh, three chromosomes pairing together or two homologues pairing together and one left out as a univalent. And this will cause problems in, in segregation and balanced gametes and then probably uh, reduced fertility in the hybrid. Um, one thing that we have to bear in mind is that uh, wild potato relatives uh, have different genomes. Some of them are homologous to the cultivated potato genome, the A genomes, and those occur in most diploid crop wild relatives, potato wild relatives. But some uh, rel wild relatives also bear a second set of chromosomes, uh, which is the B genome, for example, in Solanus poloniferum, uh, or the C genome, as in chromatophyllum, or even the DE genome, as in uh, Solanum demisum, which is an exoploid. And these are not uh, homologous. They are homologous to the cultivated potato. So they might have uh, problems in pairing and recombination. And there's a, a, another, an extra set of chromosomes which comes in the, the diploids from section A to also. Um, fortunately, most uh, cultivated, most diploid uh, relatives are uh, bear the A genomes, so uh, usually there's no problem in pairing. Um, and then we see uh, pictures like this in the male meiosis of the hybrids. Uh, uh, this one is a two EBN, a one EBN species crossed with a diploid fureja. And we see pairing and we see um, a recombination between the, the, the homologous chromosomes. And we, um, we have performed some experiments. This is uh, genome painting, GISH, and also some uh, sequence analysis. And we, we see that, for example, between Solanum commersoni and, and potato, uh, the chromosomes are homologous. They are not distinguishable in, in terms of uh, repetitive sequences. And we also see, let me take you um, into the chromosomes of these hybrids. This is a, a packeting from um, male meiosis of a triploid hybrid bearing two genomes from Solanum commersoni and one from Pureja. And uh, as you can see, uh, these are um, the duplicated chromosomes, and you can see that some of them are pairing uh, uh, homologous. Some of them are left as univalent, but in some cases, we do have a uh, pairing between the, the three chromosomes. But sometimes we see these um, loops in the pairing, which imply that there is some small difference in the order uh, of these chromosomes on some small rearrangements that uh, may impede recombination in this um, region. So what, what we have seen so far for some 1EVN and 2EVN 
wild relatives is that they, um, they have a, the same homologs as the cultivated potato and that there are no large scale rearrangements. So these, uh, these colored uh, markers are, are phytogenetic markers and we see that they are in the same order and more and, and at the same distances uh, in position uh, between the um, cultivated potato and some of the wild relatives. But we do see some school, small differences in distance. And when we look at the same markers in the, in the hybrids, we do see some uh, break in, in the pairing. So for example, here, this yellow uh, mark should be together with these here and also the green and the red. And then that makes us think that there are some small differences that need uh, attention. Then we look at the, the genome sequences of these species. So here we're comparing cultivated potato to um, from chromosome one from uh, Solanum commerzoni. And, and we do see some inversions, some uh, duplications and translocations uh, between the, the sequences of these two chromosomes. And we also see a lot of um, uh, differences in the pericentromeric region. So, uh, that, that means that we need to pay a lot of attention, not only to um, uh, the, the pair in our combination, but also where the traits of interest are located in the genome. But why do we care so much about the, these uh, rearrangements or the order in which these uh, uh, regions are uh, organized in between the crop well relative and potato, because there are different integration scenarios depending on that. Uh, we have seen that um, they, the chromosomes of the wild relatives and potato chromosomes are um, homologous enough to pair and recombine, so this should not be a problem. But we can have a problem in which we don't have the same um, homologous regions between the the hybrid, the, um, the wild relative and the potato. So in the interspecific hybrid after, and then after several back crosses, there is no integration because there are no uh, crossing overs between these regions. Another scenario could be that there is uh, integration, there is recombination, but the integrased block is very large and it carries a lot of wild uh, traits, a lot of wild chromatin. And something that was mentioned before, we can have a smaller um, block introgressed through recombination, but that can be uh, a block that carries the gene of interest, the trait of interest, but also a, a locus that is um, producing a toxin, for example, or some other negative uh, trait that we would like to get rid of. And, and that's called linkage drag. And it's, it's a problem that has been uh, discussed before. But uh, something that needs to be said is that in this scenario of diploid breeding, this is um, a lot easier to get rid of uh, because we can, we, we can, with smaller, populations we can uh, select for uh, the, the right combinations. And, and that brings us to, um, well, wild traits that can be um, found in, in, in wild relatives and that because they are so highly heterozygous, the, a lot of segregation is expected in the back crosses. Uh, but Fortunately, in diploid breeding, smaller back cross populations are needed to find the right combinations, as I was saying. Um, and the diploid background makes it easier to use markers assisted selection, as probably we'll hear later on, uh, was very successfully done here for um, resistant genes to, to late blight. Um, Still, several backcross generations may be needed to recover the recurrent uh, genotype. Uh, and that is largely dependent on the inheritance of target traits or complex uh, traits with uh, um, 
quantitative heritage might be more difficult to, to recover. And uh, well, with that, I would like to, to sum up um, saying that um, the first step is to select the accessions that carries the, the best alleles for our aim. And, and for that, we have to do a lot of uh, collection and screening of collections. Um, some hybridization barriers may have to be overcome, uh, but th these are more easily overcome in diploid breeding. Um, and uh, that one EBN potato crop wide relatives that as we were here earlier, hold a lot of interesting traits, can be crossed um, through breach crosses, as, as Professor Douches was showing, and also through unreduced gametes. But if we, we recur to unreduced gametes, then we will find some meiotic irregularities in the hybrids. Um, uh, Deploy potato chromosome while relatives, uh, sorry, diploid potato, uh, chromosome wild relative, cro sorry, crop wild relatives, uh, and its chromosomes are generally homologous and collinear to potato chromosomes, so that's not a problem for pairing and recombination. But at the micro scale, this can cause a retention of wild traits and even linkage tracks. It's very important then to know the position of, of the target loci and the type of inheritance uh, of the traits of interest, and if possible to have uh, markers that um, will help marker assisted selection, in, uh, which is a lot easier in diploid and in tetrapoid breeding. Uh, and, and something that has been discussed earlier is that it's very important to retain the self incompatibility. Uh, locus in the hybrid because most potato well relatives are self incompatible and then um, it, it can be lost in the in the process so with that i would like to thank you and um, thank all the the team in faculty of agronomy and also that we work very closely with the team at INIA in in uruguay and also at the faculty of chemistry and uh, some of the of the results that I showed you were part of my PhD at Wageningen uh, Bahen University. So with that, thank you very much, and I'm I'll I'll happy to take questions later on. Thanks, Paola. So great presentation, a lot of information, and yeah, so great to see that. So we're gonna move on to to the next speaker. So then we go to the the questions and the answer session. And the next one, it's uh, Edwin van der Rosen from R&D Director for Solinta. So he'll be speaking about market-assisted pyramiding of resistant genes in inbred parental lines. So the floor is yours, Edwin. Thanks. So thank you. Great. So thanks, first of all, to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this uh, interesting uh, webinar. Uh, for me, I guess it's maybe a first time to speak uh, as, as a Solinta person uh, in the potato uh, uh, field. Uh, I joined uh, Solinta last year, March, as R&D director, uh, taking over from the previous, uh, uh, one of the founders of Solinta, Pim Lindhout. Uh, so, um, and of course, being the last speaker of today's session, I think a lot of the introduction has already been done, so maybe I can go through those slides a little bit quicker. Uh, so the topic of today's talk is uh, Marcus' stacking of disease resistance in diploid uh, potato hybrids. Um, so I don't, again, this audience doesn't need to be told what the potential of potato is towards uh, feeding the world. Uh, but I, I, I guess we've heard already a couple of times today that Currently, potato has two major drawbacks. One is, uh, as Ott also mentioned, traditional tetraploid breeding is unpredictable and, and, and slow. Uh, many old varieties are still out there, uh, which means that actually the gain of selection is, 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 is minimal when uh, breeding at the tetraploid level. And of course, uh, uh, especially in the lower mid-tech market, there is a lack of healthy starting material due to the clonal propagation. 
And, and I think we can say that deployed F1 hybrid breeding technology uh, actually solved these constraints. Uh, here again, I think most of this has already been said, so I'll go through it quite quickly. This table basically shows a nice overview of what the uh, advantages are of uh, F1 hybrid breeding at the diploid level. Um, integration of introduction of, of crop wild relative traits can take 15 to 25 years or even longer. In the case of F1 hybrid breeding, it, 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 it only needs to take two to four years. Uh, a nice example is uh, if you want to uh, introduce at least two phytophthora resistant genes, I think in the tetraploid traditional way, it's more than 25 years, F1 hybrid breeding, two to four years. Uh, multiplication material is, of course, vegetative uh, uh, yeah, and through true seeds, through TPS, F1 hybrid breeding. I've mentioned already the difference in, in, in health of starting material, often clonal breeding or uh, the, the starting material is contaminated. Uh, if not done uh, properly, uh, TPS, you have clean starting material. Uniformity is high when you work with F1 hybrid breeding and TPS. This can still be a problem when working at TPS at the tetrapoid level. Um, and looking at the commercial interest, of course, tetraploid breeding, the commercial interest is proven. Uh, tetraploid TPS breeding, I think the commercial interest is limited. And we see also as a company like Solinta with other companies starting also and being uh, moving into the market that F1 hybrid breeding commercial interest is growing. Um, quick one here, uh, deployed F1 hybrid breeding. You start with your, with your potato germplasm and you start breeding into uh, basically in a female and a male germplasm pool. Uh, you generate elite female lines through inbreeding and line selection on both sides. Uh, you test cross, make test cross hybrids, select on general combining ability yield, all kinds of quality parameters. And in the end, you come up with your female parent, your male parent, and you generate your uh, commercial F1 uh, hybrid cultivar. Uh, this, uh, once you have your, 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 your uh, overcome your technical hurdles, which is something I'll, I'll come to later. Uh, this is a process which, which takes uh, around uh, four to five years. Um, well, we all know that uh, introduction of Phytophthora or any resistance gene from a crop wild, wild relative in tetraploid breeding takes uh, indeed uh, very long let alone if you want to stack multiple genes to a specific uh, uh, disease. And I think here already in, 2020, in 2017, we showed, Solinta showed proof of concept for, for backcross breeding in potato and diploid potato uh, breeding. And here you actually see that uh, making a cross in 2015 between a susceptible hybrid and a resistant source through backcrossing already two years later, we were able to show uh, proof of concept for stacking of resistance and introducing resistance into potato. What you see here actually is a susceptible hybrid is what you see over here. And I think the visual effect is clear. Uh, the top uh, a a field or rows are one resistance gene. The third row here is two stacking of two resistance gene. You see slightly more resistance and only one resistance gene uh, is the same one. Um, as the top one. So our, our vision actually is that we don't want to bring out hybrids with only one resistant gene. I think especially towards a gene like Phytophthora or towards a disease like Phytophthora, we actually have the vision to bring out hybrids with at least two or three uh, uh, resistance genes uh, towards such a, 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 a disease. Um, well, um, this is just to show that many resistant genes have from crop wild relatives have already, already been genetically studied. Uh, and this is just an overview. I don't think it's, it's, it's really, com it's not complete, but uh, this is just an overview just to show that many have actually been studied genetically uh, and many resistances, at least towards Phytophthora, uh, potato cyst nematodes, wart disease, virus, and I believe also to some of the other upcoming diseases and other bigger problems of potato uh, will also uh, be added to such a map like this. Um, and 
what we actually did, uh, we actually took four resistance uh, uh, genes for uh, resistance to Phytophthora and, and stacked those in inbred, uh, inbred lines. Um, and actually what you see, we took the a gene from the wild species Avilesi on chromosome 11, uh, and a gene from uh, Solanum venturi on chromosome 9, and actually two allelic genes on chromosome 10 from Tariense and Chacoense. Developed markers uh, to follow these genes in the Backcross program. Um, and in 2019, what you see here is actually the result of a field trial in the Netherlands uh, with several different uh, parental lines uh, carrying different combinations of, of resistance genes. Uh, what you see on the y axis is uh, the combination of resistance genes, or the bottom line is basically the susceptible control. And on the x-axis, you see the proxy for a susceptibility. So the AUDPC, uh, which basically is a, is a proxy for uh, susceptibility. So the lower the AUDPC, the more resistant uh, the line is, and the higher, the more susceptible. And what you actually see here is, it's, as I said, Tarienza 1 and Chacoenza 1 are allelic genes, despite the fact that they have the same locus they seem to have a different uh, resistance that generate or develop different resistance level. Um, and if you only have, for instance, Avilesi, which does confer resistance, but not very high resistance uh, to Phytophthora, if you only have it as a single gene, if you stack it together with Chacoenza, you see that there is a, a slight effect, whether it's significant, you can argue. But if you double stack Avilesi and Tarienza, you see a quite a significant reduction in, in Phytophthora. And if you do a triple stack with Avilesi, Tariens, and Venturi, you, you really have a very high level of, of, of resistance. So these are actually not the hybrids, uh, which, which have the, uh, uh, the resistance, but these are actually the parental lines, which, uh, which are growing quite well in the, in, in the field. Uh, Phytophthora is, of course, uh, as Art uh, said, is, is one of the, the, the traditional disease resistances uh, that uh, ha has been worked on for quite a while, also in tetraploid breeding. Uh, but we are also working on, on other uh, diseases like nematodes, potato cyst nematodes, Colorado, Colorado potato beetle, and we have all kinds of bioSA capabilities in house. Uh, and we develop all kinds of segregating populations to develop markers to be able to follow these. Uh, resistances in a uh, in a backcross program. Uh, so, okay, the resistant gene stacking. Uh, what is what is our strategy? Of course, we we have we we use this 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 technology, Marxist backcrossing against uh, major diseases, Phytophthora, cyst nematodes, wart disease. Uh, Colorado potato beetle viruses, and we'll be using it also uh, uh, against other uh, upcoming uh, diseases. When you design the resistance gene stacking strategy, uh, as we've already heard uh, with, the, with the previous speaker, Paula, uh, crossability and also EBA number are things to take into account um, uh, if you are working with a source which is a, a crop wild relative. Uh, but we also have also heard that uh, you can also take a commercial variety as a commercial as a source for for specific resistance. Um, the genetic position is of course important. Whether how easy you can stack or combine uh, specific resistances, allelism, uh, pro proximity to 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 each other is an important one to determine the numbers game. Uh, and of course, uh, which genes to stack for a specific disease, uh, disease complementarity of the genes, and uh, maybe also the resistance mechanism is important. If you can combine different, different resistance mechanisms, that will actually uh, help a durability of the resistance that you, that you introduce. Something else of important is tissue specificity is something you want to take into account. Uh, some genes are only uh, expressed above ground or only below ground. These kinds of things are important when you determine a, a gene stacking strategy. And last but not least, IP and freedom to operate with material uh, that you use is also uh, of, of, of big importance. Um, what you see here is uh, a strategy that we use to uh, basically convert a two gene 
stack hybrid to a four gene stack hybrid. For instance, if you have one parental line uh, with two Phytophthora genes, PI1, PI2, uh, you can add a third gene through a backcross breeding program. In four generations, we get uh, uh, the uh, near isogenic line back, uh, parental line one back again. If you do the same, you add, for instance, a nematode resistance gene to parent line two, four generations, and the fifth generation, you already have your uh, near isogenic hybrid uh, with, uh, with a four stack. Uh, we work in, in uh, climate chambers uh, with LED, uh, LED lighting, uh, full climate control. Uh, we currently do three generations per year which means if you do five generations, you can actually convert a two gene stack hybrid into a four gene in one and a half years. Uh, this is a more slightly more complex slide where you actually see uh, a strategy to convert uh, a two, the same two gene stack as shown before. For instance, a two gene stack hybrid with two phytophthora resistance gene you want to add a third resistance, Phytophthora resistance gene. You also want to add nematode resistance. You want to add wart disease resistance, and you want to add virus resistance. Here again, you can uh, stack, for instance, a third and a nematode resistance gene in four generations or five generations into one of the parent lines. You add the two, two other genes, for instance, wart and RY uh, to the other parent, parent line two, in, in five, in four generations, and uh, in five generations, sorry. And then uh, in the sixth generation, you, are, are, you can actually already make your new hybrid with four additional uh, resistance genes. And with all this is done in the climate chamber, uh, three generations per year, six generations total, this will give you, this needs two years to actually achieve um, this, this work. Um, okay, as I said, uh, I joined uh, Solinta uh, slightly over a year ago, and what I just want to share with you is, is the Solinta journey uh, up till now, uh, and what you actually see here is the development of the technology. I think that has taken, I think the first, the idea of, 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 of uh, you know, transforming potato breeding into diploid hybrid breeding, breeding was, I think it was there already there in 2006, 2007. Um, the technology from, a, from there was first a research pa phase where proof of concept was developed. Um, took six years at that time. You see on the left-hand side, sorry, the, uh, the y-axis average yield uh, tons per hectare of a specific hybrid, experimental hybrid or, or, or commercial hybrid. Uh, over the years. Uh, in 2012-13, there was proof of concept for diploid hybrid breeding. At that time, um, I think uh, the journey was quite bumpy, uh, moving from hybrid figure to inbreeding impression. I think there are key, a key hurdle there was actually to, to really look and to determine homozygosity of your inbred lines uh, very accurately. Um, so I think the next years, six years were, were used to actually refine and further develop the, the, the hybrid breeding platform. And I would say from 2019 onwards, many of the hurdles that we have, that we have also actually heard of today in many of the, uh, of the talks uh, have, uh, you know, are, I'm not, I'm not saying they are completely solved, but they are solved in such a way that we are actually moving into, a, Solinta is moving into a, a product development phase. Um, and this is typically the, the average yield per, per hybrid we are currently generating. Uh, the gray line is from seedling growth. Uh, and we know that if you grow the same hybrids from either G1, uh, you get 10 to 15% more yield. And if you actually grow it from a high quality G2 seed tuber, uh, the quality of the, the yield even improves further. I think that the Solinta journey yeah. is actually coming to a point where uh, the genetics uh, can actually start competing with, with uh, tetraploid uh, varieties when grown, grown from, uh, from a tuber. So 
So um, I believe that, uh, and I know that Solinta has actually invested in an, in an organization and now is an organization that covers all disciplines of a true integrated seed company. And uh, with a current team of over 75 people, uh, Solenta is prepared uh, for, further, for further scaling, which will be necessary, I think, to meet the future demand of uh, our superior products. And this is just, I'd like to just fi finish with this. This is just a visual of uh, some of the recent hybrids coming out of the pipeline. On the left-hand side, we see our uh, Meno Temat, the head breeder. Uh, it looks, looks very happy. And if you look at the crate, I think you can see why he's quite happy. And this is Yolanda also, Yolanda Kassenburg, another breeder we have. So this is just a visual uh, sight of what the result is at the moment. Uh, and I believe, as you saw, the curve will be going up in the next few years. And with that, Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So excited to see all those great results and information. And it's a really excited topic to, to keep discussing about. Yeah, so I don't know if Mary Dad can join us for some comments. Uh, we are going to have like two questions now that will pop up on the screen. I'll ask you just to choose the best that fit. The first question, can you help me Antonella? Uh, you know, after learning a lot about hybrid breeding strategy and some of the challenges we have, uh, I think this question uh, we can answer that. Waiting for that. So, this is about the crop wide relative. To what extent will the hybrid potato breeding strategy increase the use of crop wide relative? Greatly, slightly, not at all. And this is the last one. So with that, we can move to the q and a session. We have a couple of questions. I see that some of the questions has been already answered there. So then I would just go for the first one that I see that Dave has already put an answer. The first one is about how many crop wide relative are short day adapted. And how do you folks efficiently select for long day adaptation? Is it just a, it just, just based on upon yield? So, uh, Dave, do you, if you want to just expand your answer, and I would just give it, leave it free for, for some other speakers to, to also answer. So, uh, my under, uh, understanding is back in the 80s, Shelly Jansky uh, did work showing that. Uh, crossing uh, tuberosum dihaploids to wild species gave uh, adaptability depending on the dihaploids uh, that you used. And so we're, we think that that's a pretty good approach. I think recurrent selection will also get you there, but I, I think introgressing some dihaploid germplasm will get you there much quicker. Great. So any one of the speakers would like to take this question or comment on it? Well, maybe, maybe I can comment. I think with I, I think what I'm, I fully agree with with uh, selection. I think you can uh, you can go the way any way you want, actually. Yeah, that's nice. So we have another question here that I see that Ed provided a long answer. It's great, and it's uh, for one of the new successful deployed hybrids. How much F one seed is needed? And how many clonal propagation generation, generations are used before selling to the growers? Is it easy to produce enough F1 seed? I think uh, either uh, Ed can start and then Edwin, I think you also can comment on that. Yes, well, it, it was a, a cocktail question, three in, uh, three in one. So I couldn't make it any shorter than, uh, yeah. than, than that. Um, Actually, you can you can view a, a hybrid breeding program exactly the opposite of traditional. Traditional, you need a relatively low number of parents, and you can make an indefinite number of unique progeny. And in, in order to make uh, 100 hybrids, you need quite a lot of um, 
uh, developed and also very distinct uh, inbred parents. So, uh, and they immediately go into yield trials. So without running out of money in one year, you have to start with slow numbers or low numbers and then do your preliminary test. Um, and um, and from that time on, it will, it's very identical to tetraploids, like 95% or more is complete rubbish, but then you have a yield trials full of rubbish. So you really have to start slow, um, cut back on the number of hybrids, and then um, you know you usually have enough TPS to uh, to make two batches of tubers, and then uh, only produce more of the ones that you have. And uh, regarding the amount of seeds from inbred lines, of course the the first ones looked extremely poor, and you could hardly get any seeds from them. But that's just the general uh, inbreeding depression, and usually um, the compatibility goes first. So it doesn't have anything to do with uh, self compatibility genes. It's just the general inbreeding that has its effect. And as you start to recombine inbred lines, uh, you'll see that uh, trait improving. So then actually, TPS production is no longer a, a big issue. And uh, the the last question now that's that's more the marketing uh, the market side. Um, you can either sell your TPS to uh, uh, an explant producer that makes little seedlings just like tomato plants, and those tomato plants go to potato farmers. But many of the potato farmers that I met, they they plant potatoes with their boots, so they throw them on the ground and they kick on them, they step on them, and then they bury them. So they're not used to seedlings and actually they also admitted that they are not interested in that so uh, i'm sure there will be customers who wish to uh, to get the actual tps and make their uh, seedlings and then go with the seedlings to the field but i can also imagine that uh, specific customers will pop up that uh, start the, the initial production of, uh, of tubers and then it all depends on how clean they produce the first generation if it's possible at all to produce a second one so I uh, so then you have to think about the higher elevations, uh, production areas where not a lot of potato has been grown in the past. So, but as I said, that's that's a bit moving away from uh, from research, and uh, of course we we have our dreams about how this will look in the in in practice. Um, but you know that that's the practical situation that will that will tell, and and above the entire potato crop, there's always the risk that growers save their own uh, tubers and they plant the most ugly ones for the next in the next season. So um, even with uh, a high level of phytophthora resistance and PVY resistance, in no time you will find uh, Rostonia in, uh, in, in your seed lots. Great. Edwin, you would like to complement on that? It would be nice to see. Yeah. Uh, I, I first of all I can compliment Art with his uh, with his uh, with his answer, um, but I think from 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 a Salinta perspective, uh, it's clear that HSPC is is moving towards really. Uh, I mean, Art said it. Uh, the way to go into the market is through sea tubers. Uh, for Salinta, um, I'm not saying it's open, but I think we have. Uh, I mean, seed production is a very big, a strong selection trait for us seed producibility uh, and we are actually setting up the whole network a, a supply chain network uh, across the world to be able to quickly ramp up seed production um, and whether I think indeed uh, direct sowing of seed is, is still very far away uh, but I think it'll depend on, on on the technology level of the market that you, you move into uh, whether you are able to uh, move into through seedlings or you indeed uh, you would need one or two rounds of, of uh, clonal propagation. But there again, that will depend on how easy uh, is it to keep everything clean. So I think we are still going for our kind of hybrid, hybrid model where you can still choose depending on, uh, on the market you, you move into. Super, thank you so much. So I'm taking another question here. I was not mentioning the name uh, for those who are uh, making a question. So let me do it now. We have a question for Matthias. So he's asking, could we also find beneficial recessive traits that are appearing now 
uh, using inbreds. So, Paula, um, maybe you can take this question thinking about recessive traits, if something makes you feel comfortable. Yes, yeah, so of course, it, all the all the genetic load that uh, or, or all the um, um, masking that we had before the, in, in tetraploids, it's not present now in, in diploids. And when you have inbreds, of course, you, you start seeing the beneficial recessive traits appearing. Uh, but I don't know if if we have any examples from the actual uh, breeding programs. Uh, that that are interested in, in such traits. Uh, Ad was was mentioning those before, and and perhaps they can they can add some, some more information on that. All right. So um, yeah. So Ed, Edwin, or David, do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe I can add something. I think preferably sure. you go for dominant traits, uh, but the technology does allow you to go for recessive traits. But it will depend on. On, on the value of the trait, uh, you could have, if you're thinking resistance, uh, maybe many of the uh, resistances, you know, not the low hanging fruits. You could, you could go for loss of susceptibility traits, which actually are recessive traits. So if if you, you want to go that way, you can go that way if you want. That's great. Yeah. So let me move to this question here that uh, Dave Dudouts has already answered that, but it's, it's how many different diploid back cross parents are you currently being used by the MSU MSU program? Yeah, so our, our number was really based on what we had available at the time. And so we've been building up more dihaploids and so we're expanding our our, our parental material. So it, it's 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 really just a as as we get more germplasm we'll we'll just keep Using different uh, dihaploids for either traits or or diversity, depending on what we're what our needs are. Do you think this is a continuous process, or we're gonna stop in somehow uh, developing dihaploids? Uh, I think there's diminishing returns after a certain point, but um, at at this point, we're we're still building our our pool up because there's different market classes, and so. Uh, we don't want to have too narrow of a genetic base uh, in which to really take off from. Okay, great. So I have a question here from Jolie and she's asking, at what in breed level do you start to, do you start the test cross in the hybrid breeding scheme? So Ed and Edwin, I think it's a good question for you guys. Yes, yeah, so maybe I can start. As high as possible, basically. <laughs> uh, I think that I think that was one of the issues. I mean, you 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 know you, your your hybrids need to be uniform uh, to be able to register. Uh, so that's basically the bar you have to 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 take, right? So um, you don't. I mean, it depends a bit on on the complementarity of homozygosity. Where in the regions where they are, your your parental lines are homozygous or not, that also will will determine how far you need to go. But easy, easy, easy answer is you want to go as far as possible, but you don't need to go, don't necessarily have to have 90 or 80 or 90%. Great. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah I, I agree with that. Of course, in, initially, you aim for quite a high homozygosity because you simply do not know where your, most of your, uh, your genes of interest are, are located and exactly how many genes are involved. Because the simple answer would be no, it doesn't have to be very homozygous only, it has to be homozygous on the trait of interest. And that and, and, until you know, uh, you have to go quite, uh, quite far. Um, uh, even if uh, your hybrid looks very nice uh, optically, if, you, if your intention is to sell it in, uh, for instance, uh, Tanzania uh, as a, as a multi-purpose uh, uh, hybrid, and it has frying, you, you you say as a producer that it has frying qualities and actually one out of 10 uh, turns into a, a brown mush, then uh, it's a very bad uh, marketing, uh, marketing step for you. So you really have to be uh, on top of things. And I'm sure that uh, for the next maybe five, six years, you will be able to tell 
uh, pretty quickly uh, the difference between a tetraploid and uh, and uh, uh, a hybrid diploid, simply because it's uh, it, it's comparing it to a clonal propagated crop, crop is simply not fair. And in any hybrid crop that you see in the market today, you can find uh, quite some variation, and it, you just have to meet the uh, the the expectation and the prerequisites of your customer. And very much opposed to, for instance, a crop like tomato in potato, the most difficult customer is actually the, the, the processing industry. So where in tomato, your customer that visits the supermarket is very, very strict and very picky. In our markets, it's, been, it's the big processors, the big French fry uh, uh, company. So even if you're 99% uh, homogene with your hybrid, which is exceptionally good, if that would mean that one out of 100 French fries has a uh, has an off type color, then you're lost, you, and and they will not let you in with your next hybrid either. So you have to be very careful in which market you uh, you step into. Okay, that's a good comment. I, actually, this should just me add uh, or even add another question on top of that, which is about the market. Do you see? Uh, there will be any difference between market where the breeding process in the hybrid. Uh, strategy is going to be easier or it's just going to be just the same i'm saying comparing the traditional market with the hybrid with the processing one uh the the breeding process is, is going to be is going to have the same challenge or is having the same challenge or you see maybe it's going to be easier to develop variety for processing uh comparing to traditional market makes sense for me. Uh, um, I, i'm not saying that in the traditional market it will be easier because there you have to get exceptionally high yields as well, um, where with processing varieties, you can also take some agronomic measures that, that get you to the same kilograms per, uh, per hectare yield. Um, but it, uh, for sure, it needs uh, a, a lot more work. And, and I repeat it, for, for processing, we'll have to go for a lot higher level of homozygosity and a lot more in-house testing before we can uh, even think of going into uh, into this specific processing uh, industry. And um, I didn't mention it in my in my presentation, but in our processing is just um, French fries and crisps. So not starch breeding. If you go for starch breeding, it sounds relatively easy. You just focus on yield and starch, but also in this market, the, the number of required resistances is quite high. Great, good. So I'm just curious to know from you, Edwin, if you were guys focused on a specific market because it's going to be easier or not really. No, oh, I, I think I think I, I said it well. Um, I think it also it also will depend on. I agree with the processing market, uh, but I also know that sourcing of material is also an issue. Maybe not in Europe and 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 US, but in the rest of the world, sourcing of of material is an issue for the factory. So. Uh, I think there uh, maybe the uh, the bar will will lower slightly, but uh, indeed uh, I, I would say table would be the easiest one. Solinta has focused initially on on the table market. Uh, that's not for nothing, uh, I would say. But uh, we are further uh, segmenting our, our 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 breeding program, our pipeline. And indeed, uh, I think Odd's, Odd's words were, uh, were completely correct. There are uh, different needs for different markets, but also different technology markets, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we get a question here from Prasi. Prasi is a potato breeder in Uganda. She's asking, how do you handle inbreed depression in hybrids, in the, in the hybrid breeding? You can you can answer Edwin. So then we go to yeah. Page. I guess I guess through selection and through selection and through selection. So basically purging out the uh, the deleterious alleles, and that Great. takes time. Um, and I think the answer there is actually it's not for nothing that it has taken Solinta, for instance, at least ten years uh, to get where we want to be. Great. A good point, Professor Dave. Dave, do, do you want to add something? I mean, on the taking on that question. Uh, well, 
the inbreeding in depression is is quite serious in these early stages of dip, hybrid diploid breeding, and so uh, you just have you have to you know uh, work with your biology, and so I I think you can't inbreed too hard. Sometimes you have to to do a couple generations and then intercross again, to, depending on how how many deleterious alleles you have in your in your pool. So. Um, it, it's something you have, it's germplasm dependent, but clearly inbre inbreeding um, can be quite severe in some of the germplasm. Okay, good point. So Edwin, I have a question addressed to you here. It's what is the cylinder commercial starting material for F1, 2X hybrid seeds or tubers? It's a question from Eva. Yeah, I basically the same, same answer as, as previously. Uh, it depends on the market, depends on the technology level of the market. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also depends on how easy is it to generate uh, clean seed tubers in one or two years in a specific area. Um, so that's, that's the answer. So it's, it's we, we don't fix it to one strategy. It depends on, 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 on the market. Um, and the technology level of, of that, that, that region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take the last question here from Peter and then Peter Weber, Wenner. Oh my gosh. Oh, Al, man. this is a question that any one of you could answer. So, have you started to develop male and female pools? Is there a role for, for the uh, synthetic multi species population? in such a strategy. Yeah, whoever feels comfortable with the question, just jump in and answer, please. Yeah, so I, I think from my side, I, I think we showed we do work with female and male uh, parent pools. Uh, so yes, we do work in that direction. Okay. So, I haven't created specifically male and female pools at this point. Um, um, we're, we're, we're just um, probably just still trying to inbreed our germplasm and get a sense of where, where to go. Okay. That's great. Yeah, so Meredith, do you have some comments? You can have um, Yes, yeah, yeah. so can you hear me now? Sure. So anyway, um, just as a, a, a way to wrap up, I, I really appreciate the four very different and complementary presentations that we had today and that each of the breeders was very open with processes and informative. Um, in fact, the, the speakers addressed very well some of the questions that we were anticipating or considering in a pool, such as, what will be the type of traits that may differ in uh, inbred based breeding versus uh, tetraploid cross pollinated uh, breeding. And I was uh, very surprised to see, but also uh, in a way not surprised to see that the importance of virus resistance is not going to go away when we switch, if we switch to true seed based crops. Um, that was mentioned by everybody as a continued um, important trait. And then a lot of new traits were also discussed, but not such in detail, uh, such as the seed related traits that are going to be necessary to get the vigorous crop from uh, the, true the true potato seed based uh, planting strategy. And it was interesting that uh, David Douches presented a very uh, integrated breeding strategy with population improvement based both on recurrent selection and modified back cross. And I think that's very important because um, it's going to be important with this new strategy to ensure that we re retain diversity in our breeding pools and in our final uh, breeding lines. There's been some monitoring of maize hybrids, uh, which has shown a kind of a, an important decrease of diversity as the elite lines are developed and as more and more is known about the heterotic gene pools, that the overall diversity of uh, maize in the field might decline um, in parallel with the, the uh, uh, hybrid breeding strategies that have been important for such a long time. Um, 
I think also in Edwin mentioned the importance of testing general combining ability. And I, I did have a question as to whether maybe specific combining ability will also become more important for this breeding strategy. And um, if the hybrids will eventually result from those male and female crosses that are high in specific combining ability as well as the general type that we've been familiar to work with at the tetraploid level. Um, anyway, I think that this has been really very informative and great number of questions. Thanks to everybody and uh, for their openness and uh, enthusiasm shared through the speakers and through the uh, question and answer session. That's all, Tiago. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Mary. That was very good comments and, and wrap up in the session. Yeah, with that, I really would like to thank you all thank all the, the panelists, the speakers, and the audience who has been with us up to now. And yeah, so hope the information has brought us some inspirations to keep, you know, bring innovation to the potato breeding sector, right? Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate your attention. I appreciate you organizing this uh, meeting and, and hearing from our, our my, my colleagues today from the Netherlands and from Uruguay. Uh, those are excellent talks. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Paola. Looking forward to Thank seeing you again also uh, live someday soon. Again. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Super. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.